Good morning, everyone. Brian here with BMK Retro Gaming. This morning, I have a review for you guys of the Atari 7800 homebrew game, Casey Munchkin. This is kind of a tree review because, um, as you guys know, um, this is my first Atari 7800 homebrew game and the very first Atari 7800 homebrew game review for this channel, so this should be an interesting one. Anyway, um, the original was um, developed in and published in 1981 by Philips Magnavox for their Magnavox Odyssey, second generation Magnavox Odyssey, Odyssey 2 home video game console, which was also known uh, in Europe and PAL regions as the uh, Philips Video Pack. And, uh, well... Although, um, it ended up being pulled from the market. The thing is, um, Namco had done the arcade cabinet original of Pac-Man, I believe, in 1980. And, uh, Atari had the license to do the home ports. And, uh, well, it kind of makes sense because Casey Munchkin on the Magnavox Aussie 2 came out one year before uh, the Atari VCS 2600 port of Pac-Man would come out in uh, 1982, a year later, so how the heck could they have copied their work and been infringing upon it? Seems like the only one who should have been suing over that was Namco. You can't copy somebody else's work that doesn't exist before yours does. I mean, granted, Casey Munchkin is a dot goblin game, a dot goblin maze game, and it does have some similarities, but I think as you guys will see, it's uh, different enough that, um, well, the first court ruling actually said that the two games weren't substantial enough and uh, sided with Philips Magnavox, but Atari took it through appeal, which is where I guess uh, the judge must have been an idiot because they decided that yes, it was a clone, but... I'll say this much. From what I can tell, um, the game, like I said, is a dot-munching maze game. Uh, yes, and it obviously was uh, somewhat inspired by and takes some cues from the gameplay of Pac-Man, but it is uh, obviously its own game. There are enough differences that this could not be considered a direct clone or, uh, how do you say, um, rip-off, maybe at best an imitator. And from what I've been reading, it appears as though some people back then thought that Casey Munchkin, you know, might actually be somewhat of the superior game to the Atari VCS Pac-Man port, which was not very well regarded uh, by a lot of people, so. As it goes, um, it's a pretty simple game. You are Casey Munchkin. The name was derived uh, partially from, I forget the full name, but, um, Named after one of the uh, uh, key people at Philips Magnavox, you know, um, one of their bosses. That's where you get the character's name, Casey Munchkin. Uh, and with the video pack in Europe and PAL, PAL uh, regions, it was known as um, just Munchkin. And you have, uh, instead of a maze filled with uh, dots to munch, you have 12, which are referred to as pills or munchies in this case. And you have only 12 of them, and they move away from you. And each time you manage to eat one, uh, the, um, the remaining ones speed up until the very last one is moving as fast as you are. And then instead of chasing it down, you actually have to figure out how to intercept it. And uh, instead of having four ghosts, you have uh, three munchers, as they're called, and... One of the things that's not so great about the gameplay is they don't act very intelligent, or once they have to respawn, they don't seem like they're in a hurry to do it. So, um, there are those differences and all, and, uh, well, it's pretty decent overall. Um, I've been having some fun with it since I got it on, um, I believe I got it Wednesday or Thursday one? I forget. Whenever I did the unboxing video. And, um, it also has, uh, I'm not going to go into that in the video, but it has a maze level editor where you can kind of create your own mazes. 
Now, uh, and uh, each time you reach a new high score, you're allowed to enter your name with up to six characters, though it doesn't save either your created mazes for that uh, maze editor feature or your high scores beyond the point of you resetting or turning off your console. Still cool features, though. You have about four different mazes to choose from, and you can also select an option for a random maze, and you can also select an option where the mazes will be invisible when you are moving. So it's got a lot of good options. Anyway, I think I've talked enough about uh, it for now. Um, it was programmed, uh, the, the original developer for the Magnavox Odyssey was Ed Averett. I hope I didn't just slaughter his name, but anyway, um, he did a pretty good job, I think. He was told to create a game that would be similar to Pac-Man, or in the same gameplay style, which it is. It's in the same genre, the um, dot-munching maze game genre, pretty much. And, um, but was also told to deliberately design it so it wouldn't be similar enough to be infringing upon Pac-Man by any chance. As a matter of fact, you know, um, Atari wasn't too terribly worried about it at first, uh, but once, uh, they, uh, decided to send some, uh, employees, uh, you know, posing as customers in to stores to see what was being said about the game, they were basically being told by, even though Phillips was trying not to give this impression, store employees were telling them that this was the Magnavox Odyssey 2 version of Pac-Man, or the Phillips Magnavox Pac-Man. Which, apparently, they weren't supposed to be saying that, as Phillips Magnavox wasn't trying to incur Atari's wrath. But that's what happened, and that's what pushed it to the point of being sued, so. It was a whole mess. I think, like I said, I think the judge who decided the appeal was an idiot. This game is not similar enough to be a direct clone, and to me, unless you do something like that where it's like, you know, a reskin, you know, where it's basically the same game with just the look, uh of the characters and perhaps the maze has changed to appear different but otherwise the same game overall I don't see where you'd actually rule it as being a direct copy uh, how do you say copyright or intellectual property right infringement something which is an how do you say an imitator but does not copy directly the games uh, how do you say code or circuits or hardware any of that doesn't seem like it would say that you directly copied their work. You were inspired by it to create something similar, but your own. So, yeah, I think that judge on the appeal case was probably stupid. Anyway, um, I have uh, my uh, the copy and all here. You guys saw it in my unboxing video. This uh, is the uh, box for the Atari 78 Homebrew, which was... um. Released, uh, published and released 2014, as you can see, by Robert De Crescendo, or De Crescendo, I'm not sure how it's pronounced exactly, but, uh, I hope he'll accept my apologies for not being so good. I think it'd be De Crescendo or De Crescendo, but, De Crescendo, I don't know. Crescenzo, not Doe. De Crescenzo or De Crescenzo, I don't know exactly which one is right, anyway. He did a pretty good job from what I can tell on all this. This is a pretty nice box. Nice box art. And pretty good look to the box on back. Um, on your mark, get set munch. See the options here. One player. Four different standard mazes. Random maze generator. Invisible maze mode. Maze editor. For use with the Atari... 7800 series system with ProLine controller. I've personally been using my um, uh, Hyperkin uh, Ranger controller um, in its um, gamepad mode for a bit more ease. As you can see, it goes back and tells you that the trademarks are, you know, original for the uh, Magnavox Aussie 2 with um, 1981 North American Philips Consumers Electronics Corporation, which would be uh, Philips Magnavox pretty much. Anyway, um, we've already spent a lot of this video just talking, so here's the manual. It's a pretty simple one. Pretty nice. Um... And uh, it's only about 
besides the cover four pages. It tells you how to get started, uh, the basic gameplay, and it tells you about the maze creation with uh, the uh, editor and all. And, of course, it tells you about scoring here. This is another big difference in the game, like um, a one little white munchies is worth one point. It's worth three points to get a flashing colored munchie, which is the ones that usually power you up. And uh, the first muncher, the ghost type thing, is worth five points. Second ten. Third twenty. And, of course, another interesting difference from the game in general. Uh, here's the uh, cartridge. Pretty nice looking one. As far as I can tell, it's obviously uh, 3D printed and not... Uh, how do you say, um, a recycled cartridge. Another interesting difference is you get only one life. One. And once you die, that's it. But that's kind of an interesting and useful mechanic in that you're going for the highest score you can get and can enter your name, up to six characters, for if you get a new one. So not too bad. As I was going to say, the game has a few of its own flaws, but it's... Uh, otherwise decent. I never said it was perfect. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and plug this into the Atari 7800 and we're going to take a look at the gameplay. Guys, I have to kind of excuse me for having talked through a lot of that, but uh, this is a, a new homebrew game I haven't had a chance to go over with you guys yet. And I haven't had a chance to do one with the Atari 7800. And Casey Munchkin is already a game with um, its own fair degree of rich, somewhat complex history, even before you get into the homebrew on it. I guess one of the things that makes it much more interesting and complex is the fact that of the entire lawsuit, which I think was totally bogus to begin with. Again, how can you be copying somebody's work when it comes out a year after your own? Okay. So we're going to go for visible mazes. No, not. And uh, random. I found that random is actually... There's the editor. I was wondering how to get to that. I didn't try it yet. Random, because it gives you random mazes each playthrough, seems like a nice option in a way. And we're going to hit our button to start. Joe got the muncher and Yeah, they take a while to get back to that center. Casey is actually a pretty cool little character. You see he has the uh kind of horned up type look, I guess you might say. Lisa said, looks like he has horns on there. No, 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 no. Okay, let's try that. Here, I'm going to enter these initials in real quick. Though I hate that I died doing it. Since the uh, Magnavox Odyssey 2 had a full keyboard, it would be easier to do a bit all this and uh, for the uh, maze adder. But the... Uh, the developer here, uh, De Crescino, or couldn't really help that. Can't help that there's no, um, how you would say, uh, no real keyboard for the no real keyboard for you to use um, with the Atari 7800. At least as far as I know, there wasn't one released. You've got to be kidding me. No, you little bastard.
So you guys can probably tell the gameplay might be said to resemble Pac-Man to a degree, but it's definitely not the same. Jeez, they're moving a lot too fast right now. Well, faster than I would have been anticipating at first. Oh, come on! Well, you know that fool should be able to corner me like that so easily. Oh well. That's one maze complete. Uh, of course, you just start with a new one after that. Every time you die, it basically um, resets your score. So you have to watch out for that part right there. Well, that got them out of my way. Also, their eyes and, uh, you know, disembodied forms apparently have... Ugh, have different uh, colors to them than each other, so that's an interesting aspect of that, in a way. Like I said, this game is pretty good. It does resemble Pac-Man to a degree, but it obviously is uh, very unique and different in its own right. One thing in Pac-Man, you don't have moving dots. The uh, original um, Philips Magnavox Odyssey um, game, uh, uh, Philips Magnavox Odyssey 2 game, did not have, uh, it had a, much like the Atari VCS 2600 Pac-Man port, square dots, not uh, round ones. So obviously with the Atari 7800, the uh, graphics have been updated a bit, whereas the Magnavox Odyssey 2's graphics were... Um, They were more kind of on the level of being uh, a bit more simple, which wouldn't have been a bad thing for that, for the day or anything, but would have still made it for, uh, how do you say, a little bit of an interesting thing. With the score here, you guys can probably kind of tell already that the um, scoring is already much lower for the point values being lower. I wouldn't call that a bad thing, though. But you kind of start to get the hang of it, it's not that hard to handle the mazes. Again, the um, munchers don't seem to act terribly intelligent about this. They don't really seem to pursue you as much as they just go about at random. Whereas at least with Pac-Man the Ghost, uh, do try to take you out. Well, these guys are wandering around, so that kind of, how do you say, um, I guess you could say that has a little bit of a negative effect on how the gameplay goes in a sense. Hmm, got a little bit of a higher score there. The munchers, on the other hand, are pretty much super easy enemies. Though they can figure out a corner you sometimes, so... Don't take for granted the fact that they happen to be pretty stupid. when you don't get another high score that you haven't gotten before, it just uh, pretty much automatically puts you back in where you you can just press the button to start the next maze. Oh, 
Okay, gonna do what I can with this, and we're going to get to the, the end of this video. I had no intention of it running this long to start with, but like I said, with the legal troubles and everything, and uh, all the rest that basically went into it, um, it shouldn't be a surprise if the video turned out to be a bit long. Darn. Anyway, I think you guys more than get the idea of the gameplay by, by now. Pretty cool. Or so I think. Okay, so that was Casey Munchkin. Um, a 2014 homebrew game for the Atari 7800. Like I said, pretty good. And I think with the original Magnum Oxalacy 2 version being taken out by Atari with a lawsuit on appeal is just bogus and, forgive my language here, but bullshit. Ridiculous to me. I know some may actually disagree and think you know that, um... Atari was perfectly right to try to protect their copyright with that. I'm not saying that they were wrong to try and do that, but seriously, this came out a year before. It's substantially different as was ruled in the first ruling. So no offense to Atari or Pac-Man, but come on. Ironically enough, Atari technically failed to do the same thing with others who they tried to sue um, for... Um, Pac-Man clones and such, they actually failed in court against a, num a number of others, or they would simply try to threaten to do it in intimidation, and uh, as a form of intimidation, and there were a lot of companies, you know, who came, but some were like, well, heck, if you take me to court and prove that I ripped off your game, and it's a clone of your game, then I'll take you off the shelves, but screw you in the meantime, which is the way I would have been about it. Just because a work is inspired by something does not necessarily mean that it is a direct clone or a copy that is infringing upon the intellectual property rights. After all, if there, if there, if uh, that could be um, the same thing, really, um, we wouldn't have a ma uh, dot munching maze game genre to begin with. And there are beyond Pac-Man and Casey Munchkin, there are quite a few good games in the genre. Anyway, um, my preferred YouTuber, uh, New Retro Game Show, or the New Retro Game Show, I forget which one exactly without having to look at it, has a nice video on this game too, so I'll leave a link to that. And, uh, that's about the only one I have for this one. If you guys enjoy my channel's content, please like, share, and subscribe. And please don't hesitate to leave any questions, comments, or suggestions down in the comment section below. You guys take care, have a good morning, and I will see you again in my next video, which should be coming up this next Wednesday, and uh, will be um, an Atari VCS 2600 original library game.